So um, good afternoon uh, to you all. My name is Shane Bergen. I'm a physicist based at University College Dublin, and I am a colleague of Professor Maria Bagramian, also from, from UCD. And uh, this today is the final lecture in our Untruths lecture series. Um, and I hope you'd agree for those that have been tuning in over the last few months that the lectures have been absolutely wonderful. Um, I, I have learned a great deal about trust and the, the nature of trustworthiness and the importance of science uh, in and for democracy. I've learned about what truth is, whom we can trust and how we can develop trust in, in people and institutions. Um, so we have, um, as you'd imagined, we've saved one of the best for last. Uh, uh, today we are joined by Professor Sheila uh, Jasanoff from the Harvard Kennedy uh, school and um, uh, Professor uh, Jasanoff will be speaking on expertise, democracy and the politics of trust. What a timely issue for, for 2021. Perhaps the professor will tell us it's, it's always a timely issue. Um, I'm, I'm sure she will. So um, as I said, uh, the professor is, uh, is based at the, the Harvard Kennedy School, where she is the professor of science and technology uh, studies. Uh, P Professor Jasanoff has published a number of books, including The Fifth Branch, Science at the Bar, Designs on Nature, The Ethics of Invention, and Can um, Science Make Sense of Life? I suppose those of us that call ourselves scientists try to figure that question out over an entire career and often after that career. But um, enough from me uh, on the introductions. As always, there will be time for your questions at the end of the professor's talk. If you wish to pose a question, you can do so using the questions and answers button at the bottom of your screen. My colleague, Professor Bagramian, uh, will do um, her best to, to go through your questions and, and choose ones that are, are relevant to the talk and uh, are succinct. Um, and we'll put those to Professor Jasanoff uh, on your behalf. Uh, we, we, we do encourage you to pose as many questions as you wish. One of the signatures of this lecture series has been the, the sheer number and the fantastic quality of questions that have come from the audience. So we hope that will continue. As I said, this is the last lecture series uh, in, the, in the series, but it is not the last of Peritia, which is the European project that's funding this uh, event. Um, there will also be in-person conferences. Um, there will be online events. And if you'd like to find out more about them, you can subscribe to the Peritia newsletter and my colleagues will put information in the chat function for you. If you have been inspired by Sheila's talk today, you can go back and look at it again. And indeed, you can look at other talks from the series on the Peritia YouTube channel. Finally, uh, for those of you who are teachers or perhaps are of a school going age, I'd like to um, um, bring your attention to an essay competition that's organized by the UCD Center for Ethics and Public Life and ALEA, um, where young people are encouraged to write a, a piece on trust and to submit it uh, to um, the, the, the relevant group by March 1st. Further details will uh, be given in the chat function there. There is a juicy prize for, for the a young person who writes the, the most compelling or the most interesting essay. So I do encourage you to take part or to encourage younger people in your lives to take part. So without further ado, I will now hand over to Professor Sheila Jasanoff for her presentation today. Sheila, over to you, thank you. Thank you, Shane, for that lovely introduction. And I'm deeply honored to be closing off this uh, Peritia uh, series, but also not closing it off as you've already pointed out. Um, so Maria, thanks for taking the initiative and it's a delight and an honor to be part of this hugely interdisciplinary gathering, but one that, uh, as your last comment suggested, Shane is also trying to bridge across generations and certainly has already done so across disciplines and continents. So I'm honored and grateful uh, for this opportunity to share some thoughts. So I think I'll just go into uh, my prepared lecture and um, illustrate the comments I'm going to make with some 
um, visuals as we go along. So expertise, democracy, and the politics of trust. I mean, arguably, this is, uh, as Shane, you already ironically suggested, uh, a problem that's been with us for a very long time. But nevertheless, as we go through particular phases of our modern existence, these questions reappear sometimes in different guises. Uh, when I was looking at this project, I saw that you were focusing, of course, on climate change as one of the issues that you're discussing, but also the COVID moment and what um, some of the particular tensions are that we're encountering now. So all of this, to some extent, is underpinned by a widespread sense of crisis, are the institutions that we've created to govern ourselves big enough, robust enough, powerful enough, savvy enough, knowledgeable enough for the weight that we're laying upon them? Uh, right now, you, as many people in my audience, are closer to Glasgow, where the COP26, the latest meeting of the parties under the UN framework, Convention on Climate Change has just concluded. And I remember being in England a couple of years ago when that meeting was supposed to happen the coming year and then it was postponed. But there was a great sense of optimism that somehow the Glasgow meeting would, would shore up a, a deep commitment among nations of the world to ending this crisis that we're in. But just judging from the reports and even the text of the agreement, there's a sense of disappointment that we've fallen short, and that also contributes to this sense of crisis. And the, that is the backdrop against which our talk for today and our conversations ongoing under Peritia will be um, taking place. So what are some of the indicators of the situation we're in? All over the United States, there have been these kinds of signs appearing of a desperate desire to believe and to believe in an embodiment of science and truth. Uh, and I say embodiment advisedly because um, this uh, image of Fauci in different ways has been showing up. For those of you who are into visual culture, you'll notice that the left-hand one has borrowed the same coloration that was used for Obama's highly successful presidential campaign image back in 2008. And, you know, it's a, it's a purposeful recalling of that moment of hope. Um, and then you see Fauci, you know, displayed against the backdrop of the American flag. And I'll come back to that symbolism a little bit later in my talk as well. But as against that, you also have these skeptical denotations. It's interesting how in the Donald Trump years, Pinocchio, that favorite childhood tale that's maybe a little bit old-fashioned these days, has made a reappearance. And both Donald Trump and Tony Fauci have been caricatured as having that uh, signal, the emblem of the long nose um, suggesting constant lying. And you see there in the top cartoon a number of different moments in Fauci's own career when he is um, um, thought or characterized by the right wing as, as not having been telling the truth. And then below this, um, the other cartoon that, that suggests that not only is Fauci an unreliable witness uh, to science and to what we know, but that on top of it are um, detriments of, of character, cowardly, uh, behind journalists with leaks. I mean, so uh, not even daring to take a sort of trustworthy position in public. This draws the contrast between the content of what someone says and the performances that one is presenting of what one says. So a very different set of images connected with this one person who embodies expertise in the COVID era in the United States. And I think you can see there in four images, a display of what many people are talking about, that America is in a state of political polarization, uh, far different from and more acute than anything we've experienced um, in the past, you know, arguably uh, century. So 
let's take really deep steps back. What is going on against the backdrop of what we thought we had a right to expect? And so we know that we are in an era that is broadly spoken of as the Enlightenment. And here, this image of Immanuel Kant, a person who stood for the Enlightenment and indeed wrote an essay, a very famous essay a couple of hundred years ago, called What is Enlightenment? And in that text, Kant wrote, enlightenment is man's emergence from his self-imposed immaturity. So look at the word, words, immaturity, suggesting a kind of evolutionary stage in our consciousness, our knowledge of what is around us, but it's self-imposed. So we chose it, we embraced it. It doesn't have to be the situation of humankind. And what is immaturity? It's the inability to use one's understanding without guidance from another. So, you know, this text suggests in a way that what the stool that Kant was trying to kick away was the stool of expertise. Because what is expertise other than another in whom we place our trust, because that person can guide us through life's difficulties. Michel Foucault, the French theorist commenting on Kant, highlighted the examples that Kant gave of immaturity. And he said, when a book takes the place of our understanding, when a spiritual director takes the place of our conscience, and when a doctor decides for us what our diet is to be, when measured against these standards, it almost appears that our reliance on Dr. Fauci is the problem, it's that, that is the state of immaturity. And yet in our sort of conventional political understanding of the plight that America is in with regard to expertise, certainly all of the people around me in this very blue city of Cambridge, Massachusetts, in the very blue state of Massachusetts would think that abandoning our trust in Dr. Fauci would be the sign of immaturity. So this in a sense, the, the definition of the Kantian enlightenment and the state of play in which we think that virtue resides in trusting a figure like Dr. Tony Fauci, that contradiction is the one that I want to delve into as a matter of democratic theory and our understanding of where we are and where we need to be. So all around the Kennedy School these days, we have little signs popping up. I find them a little bit infantilizing, frankly. Um, and clearly, uh, any of you, again, who are into visual culture will notice that we must have hired somebody to pick up the right color combination to be uh, catchy and to be simple and primary colors, but we know that blue and yellow stand up in the, in the memory. But what is this consume and cover? This is appearing in all of the designated eating places around our school. Consume means eat, and cover means the moment you've finished eating, you have to put your mask back on. And why? It's to keep HKS, standing for Harvard Kennedy School, healthy. So it's a communitarian message directed toward individualist action, stated in terms that frankly smack of advertising, but it's conveying a public health message that is translated into an individual mandate to each of us. And it's very intrusive because it tells you exactly how you must eat. I mean, this is one of life's very private functions, ongoing uses of the body and your freedom to eat and drink as you please. But we're being told that at least as long as you're in the public space of the Kennedy School, you must obey injunctions of this sort. And one of the many ways in which Dr. Fauci has entered our consciousness is as an image of this kind of public health law-abiding behavior. I love this image for many reasons. Uh, among them, the combination of several different American preoccupations, health and sports, 
uh, together with the individual demonstration of performance of the right way to behave. But I think many people in this audience know that the very wearing of the face mark of mask has emerged as a site of political contestation in America, almost like no other. I mean, so the debate on face masks encapsulates a lot of the underlying political turbulence that is characteristic of America and the broader world as well, because what happens in America is not completely insulated, even though, of course, it takes specific cultural forms here. One of those cultural forms is a war of faces and masks. And while we are no longer doomed to seeing images like this all over the place, there was a time in the past year, 2020, when images of Donald Trump and Tony Fauci were warring for credibility space in American visual and political culture. And already before the 2020 election, it became clear that COVID-19 face masks had emerged as an all-American story. Why? In this Washington Post article of June 2020, the author wrote to many people masks represent adherence to civic duty and a willingness to make individual sacrifices for the greater good of public health. To others, masks symbolize government overreach and a violation of personal liberty. So the sign I showed you from the Kennedy School cafeteria clearly belongs to the first half of this description, a willingness to make individual sacrifices for the greater good of public health. But the same symbol, the same action, stands for a completely different interpretation, government overreach, and a violation of personal liberty. Now, how can that be? Are there no places where we accept restraints on personal liberty for the sake of the common good? There are many accepted restraints, and here are a few in images, and now the same ones in words. Smoking bans are widely accepted. I remember in France, people commented on the fact that once the smoking ban went into effect, the cigarette butts disappeared from the metro, and the French surely have a fine tradition of barricading streets and causing things to come to a standstill, but the smoking ban did not elicit that effect in a country and in a culture. Smoking bans, once they were instituted, took effect largely without conversation and without debate. Compulsory childhood vaccination, of course there are holdouts, but by and large, people are not complaining, certainly not to the degree that they're complaining about COVID vaccines. So there is a difference there. Mandatory seatbelt laws, again, there was some complaint at the very beginning, but by and large, the country took to it without huge demonstrations in the streets. And even bicycle helmets, I have to say that the state I live in, Massachusetts, was one of the relative holdouts against helmets on motorcycles. But again, by and large, this is a public health injunction that has not drawn forth the kind of political turmoil that has emerged around face masks in the COVID era. So this suggests that we have to push our analysis of what is going on a bit further and that we cannot take the surfaces for granted. Here is where I want to introduce a bit of theory from my field of science and technology studies. And I want to introduce the idea of co-production. It is a very deep phenomenon, but I think it can be relatively easily explained and understood. Very simply, Co-production stands for the proposition that we make the worlds that we wish to live in, that we construct the world around ourselves in a format that also allows us to live in peace in that world or live in satisfaction in that world. Now, it's a truism of the contemporary era that our worlds are made with science and technology as well as with social resources such as the law. So we just have to look around us at many things that we take for granted. I just talked about COP26, but what is the global climate? We didn't know a thing called the global climate until 
fairly recently in human history. We certainly didn't know carbon markets. We didn't understand the world in terms of populations or human rights. The Eurozone is as old as this millennium. So these are all things that we have created and we've created them in part with the use of science and technology, but also of course with law, custom, tradition and other social arrangements. Now co-production can be recognized at particular moments when these worlds are coming into being, of course, at moments of emergence. Again, my personal history by now encompasses a lot of the 20th and some of the 21st century. So I remember the introduction of the Eurozone. I happened to be living in Germany at, the, at that time, and I went home over Christmas, and I left a country that was using Deutschmarks and came back to a country that was using Euros. One of the mundane indicators of this revolutionary change was that in German supermarkets, you often have to insert a coin in order to take out the cart, thereby ensuring that you have a penalty and people don't therefore walk away with shopping carts the way they do routinely in America. So it turned out that I could insert the euro into the same slot and get the same cart and people were talking about how unbelievably smoothly we had managed the transition or Europe had managed the transition to the Euro. Well, in the past 20 years, of course, we've seen through controversies that the transition was not actually that smooth. Getting the cart in the supermarket was the least of it. Uh, harmonizing people's beliefs and expectations with regard to things like what is the right level of debt for a country, those things proved far more difficult to um, harmonize in a sense. And one might even look at the 2016 phenomenon of Brexit as in part an indication that the harmonizing effects of Europe had not been as successful as one had wanted. So that was a moment of co-production that had all kinds of fissures built into it Intelligibility and portability when things travel across geopolitical boundaries or indeed any cultural boundaries, we see co-production at work again because we see different contrasting systems trying to be assimilated to one another. And those moments reveal to us underpinning features of cultural practices, practices surrounding in particular knowledge, but also the use of artifacts that are based on knowledge in some sense. Co-production operates like any social forces through mechanisms. One can call this in social science language, operationalizing an idea. So what is co-production? How does it actually become a societal thing? And one can designate moments of these operationalizing moves. When we represent something, so when we represent COVID through a mask, for instance, we're suggesting something about what kind of world COVID is compelling us to live in. So representations are important. Discourses, how do we talk about a set of issues? What kinds of identities are being formed as we change the world to accommodate new ideas and new things? And who are the institutions in charge of making all of these operations work in a reasonable way? So those are all mechanisms through which co-production works in the world. Now, there's a deeper force at work under co-production, and that is that in effect, our constitutional systems, whether we're democracies, autocracies, or anything else, most of our political lives are conducted in some kind of constitutional order. And for a long time, hundreds of years, indeed thousands of years, systems of government have wondered about one big important question, which is why do we get ruled by so few of those amongst us? I mean, why a Donald Trump in the political area or a Joseph Biden? And why in the expertise area also single people like Fauci? But while we have thought a long time and hard about the key question for democracy, how do the people represent themselves? How do they empower political rulers to rule for the many? We've devoted far less attention 
to what I think is an equally important constitutional question for modernity. Why should the few be empowered to know for the many? Why particular experts and why do we trust in them? And that, of course, has been the thematics of Peritia and of my talk and a great bulk of my work in general. So although everybody understands that in modern democracy, we have to rely on experts, every time I talk in a complicating way, suggesting that there is something to analyze and understand about our trust and expertise, I get a series of questions. And I made up this list of FAQs for this talk today. I haven't actually presented this as a kind of thought item, a, a, a diagram to, or a, a text to think with for modern democracy. Yet these questions recur all the time. Must we let in the crazies? And of course, I've had to develop answers. And of course, we don't have to let in the crazies. But by the time we know the crazies are the crazies, the work is already done. The difficult thing is to ask about the criteria that we're using for determining who falls into this out of bounds category. So the point is not that there are in any situations, some people who are out of bounds, out of order. The point is to ask what is the rule bound center in relation to which somebody else is out of bounds. And let us not forget in democratic traditions, that the crazies may have credibility criteria of their own. I am speaking to an audience in Ireland and you have had your political difficulties with England. And the question of who was a political crazy has been one of these fracturing lines that have by no means stayed stable in history over time. And the political questions about who is out of bounds and out of order is not so different from the scientific question of who is out of bounds and out of order. A second question that I get all the time is, are you trying to say by democratizing expertise that everyone is an expert? No, the answer is clearly no. But what counts as relevant expertise depends on how the questions are framed. And we can alter the question of who is an expert by changing the formulation of the question. And we can discuss this in more detail. A third thing that people often ask is, well, can't we just delegate to the experts? And if they agree, isn't that good enough for us? Well, as an operational matter, it may be good enough for us, but we still have to agree that we've delegated it to the right kinds of people who are parading as experts in our society. And how do we recognize who belongs in this inner circle of the experts whose consensus should matter to us, should indeed govern us. Well, for that, we have a political answer that deliberation matters and deliberation always happens inside of a political culture. I'll talk about that in a moment. So not only deliberation matters, but political culture also matters. So what do I mean by political culture? And here I will retreat again back to my own research and a little bit more um, of technical analysis, though I hope that it's actually quite transparent. My analysis of expertise lodges in a multiple ambiguity of the English word body. And forgive me if in your home language, whatever it is, exactly the same ambiguity does not hold. But in English, you can think of the body as being three different things in the context of expertise. It can be the body of an individual, a person. It can be a body of knowledge. And it can be a body in the sense that we constitute a group to make decisions for us. In my long running comparative studies of the United States, the United Kingdom and Germany, I found that the weighting of these different bodies is inflected differently in the three countries. So in the United States, in America, bodies of knowledge are given pride of place, greatest significance in deciding whom to trust and who is the right kind of expert. So Dr. Fauci, for instance, often has appended to his name, the nation's leading infectious disease expert. 
that moniker, if you will, suggests that Dr. Fauci's credentials rest in no small part on the fact that he represents something that is called sound science in this country, that he is the infectious disease expert. He understands infectious diseases. And then the person who is most expert is the person who's most technically qualified in the field, whatever it is. And advisory bodies should be pluralistic, but they should contain within them the right forms of expertise. And in America, that is thought about in somewhat market terms, who are the stakeholders in this debate. In the United Kingdom, there has been a greater stress on someone who can, an expert who can represent common knowledge, what we all know in a sense. And in Germany, the emphasis has been on the product of reason, that expertise is the thing that emerges from a collective body and is represented by group deliber deliberations within a body. So not a single individual. I'm suggesting that wh whereas the US and the UK stress the role of single individuals in their expertise cultures, even then the foundations of what makes an expert an expert are interestingly different across these countries, but that in Germany, you have a departure that the collective is more important than the individual. Along with the differences in the stress on the bodies of knowledge, I'm suggesting that the embodiment of the expert who counts as an expert becomes also interestingly divergent. And the rules by which you constitute representative bodies also differ from country to country and political culture to political culture. So I'm going to illustrate this with some examples from our COVID era. So expertise in the post-COVID moment is one of the phenomena we've been studying in a 16 country study I've been conducting over the last year and a half. We call it CompCore and there I've put the a website for anybody who wants to follow the link and see some of what we've been doing. But one early finding of the study, which I'm leading with Professor Stephen Hillgartner of Cornell University and two postdocs, Margarita Reisberg and Ono Osgade, and Ben Hulbert, our faculty colleague in Arizona. I'm naming them because this is a collective project. And we have 60 researchers in all spread across the 16 countries. As I say, the details are available at our website. But one of the early findings of this study was that the virus seems to find, the coronavirus seems to find weak spots, not only in human bodies, but also in political bodies. And we discovered, and this remains a robust conclusion, that the pandemic has laid bare weaknesses in three interlocking systems, the healthcare system, the epistemic system, which is the system of expertise, and the political system, um, or the political economic system. So in the epistemic system, for instance, particular stress has been laid on American civic epistemology, American ways of cultural knowledge, which frame facts as sharply separated from values. And I want to illustrate that for a moment. So although it's become commonplace, became commonplace during the Trump era to refer to his presidency as the post-truth moment. In fact, and this goes back to Shane, your original comment, in America, we've arguably been in a post-truth moment for a very long time, certainly at least since the Reagan revolution of the 1980s in a very overt way. So in the 90s and 90, 1980s and 1990s, America had debates around the right forms of peer review, around junk science in the court, a very major um, Supreme Court decision on evidence in 1993, and then in the mid 1990s, the science wars, all of that was about who controls the truth what is truth and who's responsible for it. These debates continued into the 2000s in the presidency of George W. Bush. Peer review debates have continued. A book was published called The Republican War on Science, which associated 
the problems of anti-science with one of the major political parties and various forms of so-called denialism, um, as well as debates about the public understanding of science and whether the American people are actually knowledgeable enough to govern themselves any longer without the assistance of expertise. And the 2010 saw a ramping up, a revving up of the very same debates with additional discursive items thrown in, such as the alt fact and a high degree of polarization on public truths. So in America, where the reliance on neutral science and on science's neutrality has been strongest, we've also seen an ongoing splintering of trust in expertise and in the credibility of experts. The last election brought this home because one of the parties explicitly claimed that its political victory was also a victory for science. Now, is this even a wise thing to do if you want your polity to come with you on science and expertise? Is it reasonable to say that politics trumps all and conquers all because then aren't you doing the same thing as the previous administration, only putting yourself on a different side? And indeed, there has been a co-optation of the nation building ideas in America by science. So one can remind oneself that America's national motto, so much central to American political life that it's actually featured on the $1 bill is in God we trust. And in Fauci we trust, it's not just the colors of the successful Obama campaign poster, it's also a co-optation of the motto of the United States in service of a particular set of ideas about expertise. And some might even regard it as bordering on blasphemy, should we say, to take over the words from the motto of the United States and to put an embodiment of a person there. So there is this deep tension in America between the supposed neutrality of science and then the political co-optation, appropriation of science itself and the people who speak for science as hugely political acts. Now, I'm not going to go into the same detail for lack of time in either Britain or Germany, but I want to point to two recent episodes that to some extent highlight the idiosyncrasies and the differences across political cultures. So Matt Hancock, former health secretary of the UK and arguably a representative of embodied expertise had to leave office because he failed the British epistemological test of doing what common knowledge requires of you. So there were social distancing rules, which by and large people accepted much more readily than in America. But when Matt Hancock violated those rules himself and his private behavior, he essentially had to tender his resignation. And this was so deeply marked or remarked upon in political culture that a secondary story emerged of the queen telling her prime minister that Matt Hancock was a poor man. I've just been talking to your secretary of health, poor man. He came for privy council, she told the prime minister. He's full of, she added, full of beans, offered Mr. Johnson. Okay, a moment of levity with the monarchy aside. Uh, the queen, as an embodiment of certainly some aspects of British rule, recognizes the embodiment of the expert and how the expert cannot deviate too much from common understandings of what public health means as it touches down on our lives. Turning to Germany, I find this an interesting story. So in Germany, you'll note I've talked about how the political culture uh, favors a collective decision-making on expertise. And the chair of the German Ethics Council received a prestigious award, a prize, Now, you might say, isn't that suggesting that Germany also believes in the personal embodiment of expertise? But if you look at what Elena Box said as she received the award as the chair of the Ethics Council, and what the, what the 
body itself put on its web page, they said Ms. Books regularly succeeds in bringing together the multiple perspectives of different scientific disciplines and communicating the result of these deliberations in a clear and accessible language. So for those of you who are into political theory, you will recognize underlying that sentence, Habermas and his spirit abroad in the world. So it's not that Elena Books is being recognized because of her personal merit, but because she embodies these aspects of German political culture, the ability to bring together the multiple perspectives of different scientific disciplines. And keep in mind that when a German says scientific, they mean Wissenschaft and not just natural science. So of science and ethics, for instance, and communicating a Habermasian word, the result of these deliberations in a clear and accessible language. So I thought that one should just present a few concrete examples, even though it's obviously not um, the totality of the research enterprise that underpins these kinds of observations. What does that lead us to thinking? It leads us to thinking that political culture puts us in the place of this famous image of the blind people and the elephant. It goes back, among other sources, to a Jain um, uh, fable of the blind men um, feeling out different parts of an elephant and seeing only that part that they can touch. But I think it's a kind of... Um, small uh, representation of the problems of, of expertise in our highly advanced knowledge societies and democracies, that culturally we are all situated in ways that disable us from seeing the elephant because we're seeing parts of it, and that this has to feed into the what is to be done question with which I will end. So if we are in a fragmented world, if we are post-truth or after truth, what kinds of questions can we nevertheless ask to channel skepticism itself into productive forms? And my final set of contentions is that the questions themselves are questions that are fundamental to any democratic order. So it is not a question of rejecting expert authority in and of itself. It's a question of making sure that expert authority fits our political understandings of what is good expertise and what is right expertise. And so here is a series of questions that I think we're all entitled to ask, regardless of our political culture. The answers may be needing to be filtered through the lenses of political culture, but the questions themselves are very general. So who claims to know? This is surely something that we are entitled to ask all the time. In answer to whose questions, this is the framing point, that answers are only going to be as robust as questions. And we are always entitled to ask who put the questions in that way, not, not just who is claiming to have the answers. On what authority did the questions get formulated in the way that they got formulated? And this is different in localities, in regions, in nations, and at the international level. So the question of authority is always important to ask. With what evidence? So if somebody in charge frames a problem or a question in a certain way, we're surely entitled to ask, what was the evidence that led to that particular framing? Was there any oversight or criticism? The who shall judge the judges? Who shall be the supervisor of the experts? This is always a set of questions we can ask. So was there oversight? Was there criticism? Were there openings for exp expressing countervailing views or was it some kind of monolithic exercise? And last but not least, what closure mechanisms were there in cases of disagreement? And you can loop back to, from those closure, me closure mechanisms back to on what authority and with what evidence and subject to what oversight or criticism. So this then is a series of questions that I think we're entitled to ask. They go beyond denialism and destructive skepticism to the heart of how to make expertise 
fit into democratic social orders. And with that, I will thank you and conclude. Thanks. Um, Sheila, thank you so much for your, your wonderful presentation. Uh, I feel I've learned so much uh, from you in, <laughs> in only 45 minutes. I'd, I'd, love, I'd love for you to be able to keep going for many more hours, but unfortunately, we've come to the end of your presentation. We have lots of, of questions that have come in from the many people uh, who've also enjoyed uh, your presentation. And many of those are saying, saying that very thing. They're saying, gosh, this is great. We're really enjoying it. What a wonderful presentation. Our first question is from Suzanne Cass. And Suzanne asks, as researchers, we have practices um, that allow us to critically test and develop knowledge about a topic. Yet we continuously expect lay people to accept knowledge and follow advice without any connected practice or evaluation. Suzanne asks, how might we be able to develop practice-based ways to share expert knowledge and respond to non-expert knowledge or concerns about a topic? So Suzanne, that's a very sophisticated question, but just the very fact that you're asking it shows that certain kinds of uh, collective understandings have percolated through the world. So many young people in the sciences today are very caught up in science communication and they understand that people have to be invited into their practices in the field of STS. There's been a lot of work on how you can do upstream participation by engaging people in scientific practices. And so I think that it's not, there's a great deal of worldwide experimentation going on in how to engage people and citizens in the work of science. Shane, the, the prize that you announced, I mean, after all, that is a way of engaging very young citizens into the practice of thinking about trust. I mean, so you could see this paratia itself as having an associated practice of how to democratize understandings. My main worry about this is that it tends to be very unidirectional. It's how to engage citizens in the practices of science and not scientists in the practices of citizenship. And I think at the very least, it should be a completely symmetrical proposition and not just the one direction. I couldn't agree more as somebody who spends a, a great deal of time thinking about so-called public engagement. I, I, I feel that's a very important issue. Um, they're not having a monopoly on, uh, on, on such things. Um, perhaps an, a linked question from Linda Salmon um, asks, uh, how is all of this, and by this your, your work reflected in practice um, within international bodies such as the UN or the WHO? <laughs> Linda, again, a, a very um, a pointed question. Um, so I think anybody who does any kind of science or, or um, research-based work knows to be humble about the migration of one's work into you know, other places. So one of the things that I'm constantly amazed by is that people think that I wrote my best book in 1990. I mean, you know, that's 31 years ago. And, and if that's so, then the last 31 years, I mean, a human generation will be in vain. And, you know, I'm a pretty vain person to think that my more recent work is more important than my old work. So I try to tell myself this is all about the migration of ideas. So where the ideas are crossing boundaries, institutional boundaries like you describe, and national boundaries, then one can expect that things will filter slowly. But the, the optimistic side of things is that, for instance, a body like the OECD, the Organization of Economic Cooperation and Development now has an emerging technologies division that is actively taking STS ideas on board. Not just my ideas. I mean, these are not personal things. These are collective things. I have been approached in the, you know, over the last couple of years by bodies such as WHO, such as UNESCO, such as OECD. So these international bodies are coming um, two sources of expertise and advice on matters of the sort that we've been discussing. Indeed, in some ways, international organizations that do not have their own established knowledge cultures are a bit less impervious than mm -hmm. national bodies that do have their established practices and cultures and are sometimes harder to penetrate than the international ones. And I suppose 
perhaps living in the European Union, we see it can take time for such things to become established. Uh, a great question from Francis uh, Remedius, uh, who asks, can expertise be non-epistemic? And if, if so, how can that type of expertise be le uh, legitimated? Um, thanks for that, Francis. The uh, expertise absolutely can be non-epistemic. Of course, that depends a bit on what you choose to call epistemic. I mean, is the knowledge that's in the fingers of the pianist or of the talented chef uh, epistemic or not? I mean, you know, if you want to be materially reductionist, it goes back to various nerves and how they work in the brain and so forth. So, you know, uh, but nevertheless, if by epistemic, we mean something that can be filtered into abstractions and passed along in words, then skills and experience very much are part of expertise. In the common law, at least as practiced in the US, expertise is defined quite broadly as including knowledge, but also skills and experience. And um, in, I mentioned in passing the Supreme Court decision of 1993 that talked about emerging science and what are the right standards for allowing emerging scientific evidence to come in and play a part in legal proceedings. But there was a later decision that explicitly widened that and said that similar standards apply to expertise of all kinds. So that was a time in the early part of the 1990s when the US Supreme Court had to wrestle with exactly the same question and said that, yes, any body of discipline knowledge, whether it's epistemic in the strict sense or not, should be filtered using similarly rigorous criteria. So um, very much uh, agreeing with the spirit of your question. Mm. Um Heather Douglas has our next question, um, and Heather uh, thanks you for such a rich talk, I'd agree, and she says, is the long history of post-truth in the US, uh, is, it, is it in particular to the US, or is it actually a history of, of any polity where expertise is uh, potently relevant to governing? Heather, I'm so sorry that we're meeting across the divide of the two Peritia series, because I know you spoke in the first one and we haven't met in person in way too long, but it's nice to meet you virtually in this way. So you will, of course, see that if you buy into the idea of co-production, then in a sense, uh, there has been a history of truth and post-truth for every bit as long as there has been a history of power because power needs knowledge and knowledge to be active in the world needs power. Now, it may not formulate itself in the same way. I mean, that is questions of what counts as truth are being debated now in modernity and in the global order in a very different way and using different terminology. But you could say that even when people are not raising these questions, it's because this other idea that is the center of this series is so pervasive, trust is pervasive. So in many stories, as you know, of scientific misconduct, the misconduct has gone unnoticed for very long periods of time, and then suddenly it bubbles up. So we're going through the trial of Elizabeth Holmes in this country, and it's been publicized widely, but her company, Theranos, achieved an astonishing market valuation before the truth claims were tested. So what was happening in that period? I mean, were there, overtly there were no questions, but does that mean that people, it doesn't mean that the claims were true by some standard or other that we could apply. Um, it just suggests that the that the lack of overt debate on something simply masks, if we can borrow that word, um, a, a state of play in which uh, credibility is being um, so widely accepted that that people are accepting the political authority and the knowledge claims that underpin it without raising questions. In that sense, I think that that the um, history of truth and post-truth is just as long as the history of humanity. 
gosh, we could talk about that for another few hours. And I'm conscious we are coming close to the end of our, our time today. But there are so many comments coming in today, Sheila, saying um, just how much people enjoyed your outstanding present presentation. So thank you to, to those who are viewing and sending in those lovely comments. We'll be sure to send them on to the professor afterward. I have a question here from Florian um, Primig, I think is how you say Florian's name who again, thanks you for an amazing lecture. And their question refers to co-creation. Um, if we look at the trust ratings for science in Germany, we can see that trust is quite pronounced, um, but at the same time, an increasing number of people, they suggest 40%, believe that science should not interfere with politics. And the question is, how do we make sense of that? Do people uh, rather rely on scientists to do their thing properly in their labs instead of trusting them in a real trust relationship. Um, could that be the case of uh, because of perceived lack of co-creative space in science? That is, are people trying to regain interpretive power in the face of science and its logic? It's a long question, but I think it's trying to make sense of that divergence, perhaps, as this person sees it. No, I think it's a long and really rich question. And again, mm. Shane, that could preoccupy us for hours, but it just suggests that it's a good thing that conversations never end. Um, Indeed. And I'm happy to be participating in this one. So there is a there is a very important point at stake here. I mean, if we want to govern ourselves according to values that we hold dear, there is some, you know, widespread understanding that specialist knowledge is not enough in and of itself to declare what values we hold. Um, and indeed, I would go further and say that specialist knowledge is often created to meet a set of values that may or may not be widely shared. I mean, you know, just to take a very trivial example, the atomic era, which has released a sense of catastrophism into the world and arguably was one of the impetuses for the climate world that came into being. Uh, you know, where did much of that work take place? On a remote mountain in a remote state of America under veils of secrecy. And it was certainly not agreed to by humanity as a whole that one country with the ability should go off and make a weapon that could spell a catastrophic end to humankind. So, you know, it's not, and yet we are in that era, like it or not. And many of the things that we want to do to govern ourselves have come from that moment of arguably, you know, constitutional overreach, where um, a few people with particular capabilities were producing uh, an intervention into the world that altered all of our consciousness. We should bring that kind of understanding to bear on a modern phenomenon like geoengineering, which arguably wants self-consciously to be generating that kind of intervention into, into the world. And we should learn from our historical time. So it's not allowing having trust in scientists to govern the world. It's, it's having trust in ourselves to incorporate knowledge making into our practices of governance. And, you know, maybe the simplest way to put it is that we all left to our own devices tend to fall into a linear trap that we think facts come first and decisions come later. And the very simplest understanding of STS, science and technology studies, is to say that there is a decision values framework already in place before that linearity. And maybe it's best not to think of it as linear. I mean, after all, we're all children of the era of the double helix. Surely we can think of knowledge and power as being in a double helical formation, even with certain sugar phosphate bonds in between. <laughs> um, I love your reference to the, the modern era there a moment ago. And uh, it reminds me of a question here from Warren Pierce, who says, do you think COVID is a new lens through which we are seeing the familiar democratic traditions and Warren suggests polarization um, with things like uh, face masks in the US, for example. Or Warren says, perhaps is there signs that COVID is bringing about changes in the relationship between science and de uh, democracy? And thanks Warren for that question. And thanks for your partnership in our project over the last months. Um, you know, isn't the answer to anything interesting always both and? <laughs> I mean, so, 
cataclysms <laughs> always <laughs> cataclysms happen and they shed light they're like blinding light and you see corners of the world that were not illuminated before and then what do you do about that so i do think that social orders are very robust and when they've been enshrined in law and institutions we have purposefully given a robustness to them so the very words in which we debate things can have resonances and repercussions that are very important to us i mean why is it that some of the oldest texts in the world are religious texts why is it that i product of a totally secular upbringing could speak the credo, the Latin mass text in Latin. I mean, there's something both beautiful and enchanting about these forms of words. And so I think institutions are like that. They are touchstones. We go back to them. For those of you who were at all brought up in my era of learning English, you know that the King James Version has a place that no other version has. But it's like that's a metaphor. It's a metaphor for the ways in which we make social order. And do we change them? Yes, yeah, sometimes radically, like paradigm shifts and revolutions. But I don't think COVID by itself, without political will, without a lot of people recognizing that now is the time to rethink the directions we've been going on, that COVID, the virus will not do it. We will do it. But that's why we all do our research and speak and try to have the kinds of influence that an earlier questionnaire questioner was asking about. Well, what, what a wonderful place to stop. Um, I, I was going to ask you, you know, what would you say to a leader if you were speaking to him or her at the moment? And I, I feel if, if I were there now and relaying some of your ideas today, I, I'd say that, that in personal empowerment, that's such a wonderfully rich idea but maybe maybe we will end by by giving you that last word what would you say to uh to to a leader uh if if you had um time for tea with them as opposed to a meeting you know where you were being able to talk freely with them um, with about your ideas up such images of buckingham palace that i'm tempted <laughs> to say that if i were talking to boris johnson i would say oh you poor man but <laughs> but i think that to some extent following on the analytic threads that I've been discussing, the message would be different things to different people. Now, in the Biden administration, and I'll conclude with this, for whatever reason, a fissure has opened up. For the first time, a presidential administration in the United States is acknowledging in some sense that science and society are linked. And we don't have time for this, but certain appointments they've made, certain steps they have taken suggest that there is a recognition that science is in society and society is in science. In other words, a co-productionist recognition. But in operationalizing this, there is a huge danger that people will just go back to re-inscribing you know, let's be sound science and let's do things scientifically. And then once the experts have agreed, let's put these out as, as rules for the world. So I think that the place of critical inquiry of the sort that we all do in some sense in our respective homes and places, that that never ends, that one has to keep going back. Habit is a really amazing thing. I mean, the entire economic theory of nudge is nothing more than a glorified understanding that people have habits and habits are hard to break. But, you know, if we want to break the bad habits of our society, including carbon consumption at rates that we can't afford, um, we have to sort of recognize that these moments, like the COVID moment, are times when we should be reflective of the particularities of the bad habits of each society. And so I would not have a one size fits all comment for all of the world's leaders. I would try to tailor them in some sense to the particular leader and the kind of tea I was being served. Well, when you come to Dublin, we'll be sure to uh, to serve you Irish breakfast tea. Um, so Professor Sheila um, Jasanoff, thank you for your, your wonderfully rich presentation today, an inspiring talk uh, for us to end 
the Peritia Lecture Series. As I mentioned at the start, all of the lectures are available on the Peritia YouTube channel, and you can subscribe to the Peritia newsletter if you wish to take part in or contribute to some of the future events that will be in person and online. It has been a pleasure uh, for me to, um, to speak with so many experts uh, over the last year and to field so many of your questions in that time. So it just leaves me to thank our speaker, Professor Sheila Jasanoff again today, and to thank all of the organizers, Professor Bagramian, and so for arranging this wonderful, wonderful lecture series. Thank you all so much and goodbye. Thank you, Shane, and thank you, Maria, and everybody else. Bye.